Okay, thank you. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Morning. All right, so what we're going to do now is just give the others a minute or two just to join us before we proceed. You guys want to kindly switch off your mic so that yeah we don't get any background uh, noise or, or music. All right, thank you. Okay, so welcome to I'd like to say Chemistry 101. Uh, I think some of you or most of you have already met me, uh, Prof. Govinda. Just want to switch on my um, camera. Please hold on to your chairs. I've got a face for radio, so I don't want you to get a fright. And uh, so that you see that you're actually speaking to a real human being and not a robot on the other side. So yeah, it goes, guys. Um, that's me over there. Hi. And uh, yeah, so welcome. So what I'm going to do is just switch off the camera and then just continue with the lesson. Feel free to ask questions, to stop me. Um, as I go through, if it's not clear, let me know. I'm also recording the entire session, so uh, I can send that through to uh, to Sir, and maybe we can put this onto your Google Classroom to review as well. So thank you for joining me on a very very early uh, time slot. Um, my lectures at university normally starts at uh, start at ten, so this is something new for me. All right, so I'm just going to proceed and prepare a really cool lecture on uh, chemistry. Uh, hopefully, uh, you're going to enjoy this and learn something. So by the end of this uh, session, you'd be more in touch with the chemical formulae, reactions, and how to calculate quantities. And I think that's important as well. All right, so very quickly, just to share the screen. And for those who just joined us, thank you very much for coming in there. Right, so I'm just going to drop that as well quickly. There we go. Right, can everyone see uh, the screen itself, the mole concept and stoichiometry? And can you hear me clearly? Yes, sir. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, you know, sometimes you can go through a whole, a whole lesson with the others not seeing anything or even listening to you. So. so today I thought I'll start with the mole concept and stoichiometry, but I just want to take you a couple of steps back as well. And I think that's important. Um, I'll stop the video there, yes. Um, it's always important when you're learning science, mathematics, or any subject for that matter, is to take a few steps back, review what you've already known, and move forward. You see, science is not built on just the current knowledge. It's built on what we've learned in the past, then we generalize those concepts, and we move on to new knowledge. I think that's very important, all right? You don't learn this now, you're in grade nine. You can't forget your grade eight stuff and hope you know, to proceed to grade nine, to grade 10 and forward. Uh, so just, just move on very quickly and I'll just take you through a few uh, slides and then we can discuss this. All right, so um, just a quick question. What do you think's in this little animation there or little video, what do you think's happening over there? Um, okay, so just a quick one, and you could say, but that could be anything. Uh, it could be the flat earth, for instance, in its early days. People still believe that the earth is flat. But this here is nothing more than a small quantity of dry ice. Now, can anyone give me the chemical formula for dry ice? Or what is dry ice? Let's start over there. That's a fish layer. Yeah. Anyone? 
So dry ice is nothing more than solid carbon dioxide. And you would recall that the formula for carbon dioxide is, anyone? CO2, sir. CO2, thank you very much. Yeah, so it's interesting what you see in this picture because you have a solid in the middle there. That's your dry ice, right? And you suddenly see that it starts to form a vapor. So which means it misses the liquid phase. And we know this, dry ice goes straight from a solid to a gas missing the middle phase called the liquid phase. Because if you had a chunk of butter and you place that onto a hot plate, the butter will start to melt to form a liquid and eventually the liquid will warm up to such an extent it will start to evaporate. But here, the, the liquid phase is skipped. That process is called sublimation. And you may have come across the word sublimate or sublimation in grade eight. So that's interesting as well. Uh, the next one is also cool, and uh, I'm hoping that, you know, when I, when, when I get back to school and meet you guys, that we'll actually do these experiments. So you may have already done this. And this is taking ammonium dichromate, which is a beautiful orange color, and then setting that alight. And you'll notice that it starts to burn almost like a volcano type effect. The temperature within that core is quite high, a few hundred degrees Celsius. And what you'll notice from the video is that the orange powder, there we go, that's what we started with, converts to a beautiful green powder. So we as chemists or scientists need to understand how the color change came about. So surely we write up ammonium dichromate and that now converts to a new substance. And it's important to find out how much of the substance is formed and under what conditions. And that's the reason why we go to the concept of what we call stoichiometry, nice big word. And it's really the axis or the backbone of chemistry or trying to quantify things. Essentially, it's bookkeeping in chemistry. That's what I like to call. So that's just my introduction slide. I'm getting carried away here. Yeah? Are there any questions? Anything that you want to ask me? Okay. So I'll take your silence as yes, uh, we can move on. So very quickly, just some, uh, as I said, uh, some revision. What's the formula for oxygen? And if you're getting bored, let me know as well. What is the chemical formula for oxygen? O2, sir. O2, O2 right. So uh, oxygen in the atmosphere exists as a diatomic gas. So the formula there would be O2. And someone said carbon dioxide is CO2, right? CO2. Anyone, the formula for ammonia? You may have come across handy handy or something in your kitchen. It would have said something like handy handy with ammonia. Anyone wants to hazard a guess as to what this Isn't formula would be? NH something? Yes, NH something, that something is three. Very good, thank you. So ammonia is NH3. And you'll find this popping up all over the place. And one of the reasons why ammonia is so important to us is not just a cleaning agent, but it's used in the fertilizer industry, all right? So in the manufacture of fertilizers, ammonia plays a very, very important role. So you'll see that coming up over and over again, especially in grade 11 and 12. Now, if you look at ozone, does anyone know the formula for ozone? You may have heard of the ozone layer. So wouldn't that thing contain all the gases that are in the ozone uh, layer? Layer, like, yeah. Like, uh, it's, it's hydrogen yes. and then hydrogen is argon, maybe, I'm not sure. So. Right. So basically, yeah, you're right. The ozone layer will consist of a, a, a multiple uh, you know, composition of gases, but ozone itself is really a compound. And what happens there is you've got free oxygen radicals combining with O2 molecules. So the actual ozone gas is O3, okay? So while you're right, the ozone layer may consist of a mixture of gases. The actual gas ozone is O3. And that is interesting as well, all right? Potassium chloride, I'm just throwing some stuff at you. And someone's, uh, sorry, someone's got their hand, S pen, got your hand raised up, uh, raised. Someone had a question? No? Okay. Potassium chloride, guys. 
Anyone? Okay, so potassium chloride is just KCl. KCl. K for potassium, Cl for chlorine. And the most common one is table salt. Does anyone know the scientific name for table salt? So isn't it sodium chloride? Sodium chloride. What's the formula? Uh, NaCl. Okay, NaCl. Absolutely important uh, compound. But what I like to basically tell you right now is if you look at table salt, it's, com it's a mixture of two things, a combination of two things, not a mixture, it's a combination of two elements, right? So it's a combination of sodium, oops, which is a metal, and you got chlorine, which is a poisonous gas. And if you combine those two, you get table salt, which is edible. It's quite interesting as well. Now, I wanna ask a question, because I do some crazy things. Has anyone ever melted table salt? Or tried to melt table salt? I'm not sure why you do it, but anyone attempted to do that? You'd find something very interesting about table salt. It has a very high melting point, about 800 degrees Celsius. So you've got to be very, very careful when you're starting to melt table salt that you might melt your pot before the salt melts. So be careful over there. All right. So now, I just want to quickly, before I get there, just want to take you back to something that you're familiar with there. Now, you know this is the periodic table, all right? And you would have went through it, and you see a whole list of, are these elements or compounds? Elements. Elements, yeah. elements right? Now, there are only two liquids on this periodic table. Which are they? Um, Korean bromine. Bromine and mercury, okay? At room temperature, you only have two. I think they've just discovered a new element. So I've just read, I'll share that with you guys as well. But for me, as a physicist, as you know, uh, astrophysicist, the bottom section here is pretty important. These heavy elements at the bottom here, especially things like uranium-238, 236, uh, polonium, for instance, uh, fermium, most of these are heavy elements and they radioactive. But you'd find that most of these elements that you see are actually manufactured in the core of stars. Because you're going to ask yourself, where do our elements come from? You know, um, so they're actually manufactured. So everything is stellar. So when a, when a star is born, it starts accumulating matter, and then it starts producing new elements new, by nuclear fusion and fission. And as the star gets older, its, its core starts to convert from carbon and eventually ends up at iron 56, which is here. And then the star eventually explodes, that star does travel into space, and then the whole process starts again. So that process is called nucleosynthesis. But for me, what I would like to tell you, and this is something that my teacher told me many, many years ago, and that is, learn up the first 20 elements of the periodic table, all right? So you start off with the first uh, element there, which is hydrogen, right at the top, and you walk your way down, lithium, sodium, potassium, all the way down, cesium, francium, beryllium, and then go all the way, and you'll stop at calcium, because calcium is the 20th element, right? From one to 20, learn everything about those. Uh, and then I, you'd find that most of the chemistry is actually based, uh, a lot of school chemistry is based on the first 20 elements. Of course, there will be others like uh, the group seven elements. Does anyone know what the group seven elements are called? The halogen group. The? Yes, someone said something. Yes? The halogen group. Sir. The halogen group. Yes, excellent. So that's a very important group here. So as I go through the lesson today, I'm going to keep referring to the periodic table as well. So let's just go back very quickly. And I want to introduce to you a very important concept, and that is the mole. Now, have you guys come across the concept of the mole in chemistry? No, sir. All right. So this is extremely important. To give you an idea, you know, we measure time in seconds, we measure time in hours, but the scientific unit, SI unit for time is the second, right? What is the standard unit for length? Anyone? What is length measured in? Centimeters. 
right, centimeters, you could have millimeters, but the standard unit for length is the meter. That's called the SI unit. It's an uh, international system of units and it's the meter. And then the other very, very important concept is the mass. What is mass measured in? Thanks, yeah. Mass is measured in kgs and it's also measured in grams, milligrams, absolutely true. So your SI unit, your international unit for mass is the kg. So chemists, what they want to do, they do their own things as well. They've got a whole, their own set of rules and they're very interesting rules. So when they speak of a quantity of substance in chemistry, they call it the mole, right? So that's over here. Sometimes you see it's spelled as M-O-L-E or M-O-L, as in the unit. Now, one mole is very interesting. So you're going to ask, ask, how do I define a mole? So if you look at the second line here, this is quite interesting. And I know in grade eight, you started off with something called scientific notation in mathematics. So one mole is given by that very large number over there, 602 billion trillion whatever. Exactly, right? It says things. Now you can't write down, every time you write down the definition of the mole, you're gonna write down that number of zeros. So we use scientific notation, so one mole of any substance, this is interesting, contains 6,02 times 10 to the power 23 things. Let's use the word things. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is a chemistry lecture. We don't use word like things. And we'll quantify, qualify the meaning of things just now. Are there any questions at, at this point? Anyone wants to contribute to say something? No, sir. All right. So I just entered, I basically just introduced the concept of the mole. And we said that one mole of any substance contains that number of whatever we'll define just now. So remember that number 6,02 times 10 to the power 23. All right. And so this number was actually, I wouldn't say discovered, but put forward by a guy called Avogadro. Okay, 9th of August, 70, 1776. I don't know why I've got such a small picture of him there. It's also known as Avogadro's number. It's named after this guy. It's such an important number in chemistry. No, not avocado. I've seen students refer to this number as avocado. Avocado is the pear, I think. And I'm still not sure whether an avocado pear is a fruit or a veg, but you can qualify that. But it says that one mole of any substance contains Avogadro's number, and the number is six times 10 to the power 23. I'm gonna change the word things to particles. Okay, so we now know that Avogadro's number contains that number of particles. So one mole contains 6,02 times 10 to the power 23 particles. And you might say, but hey, you're saying the same thing a thousand times. You'll see why shortly. All right, so how big is a mole? Let's get a feel for these numbers. So for instance, I mean, we know what one second is. It's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, 1,001, 1,002, in that time interval, that's one second. So we know how long a meter is, but very few people have an idea of how heavy one kg is. Now let's not try to confuse heaviness with mass. But if I had to take you into a store and ask you to pick out, say, four kgs of potatoes and put it into a bag, 99% of the time people get that wrong because people have no idea what one kg really is, all right, as a feel. Does anyone know the mass of a, a typical apple? Anyone? What is the mass of 20 grams. grams. Yes, how many grams? grams? 220. 20 grams, okay. Anyone else? Okay, anyone else? 200 grams. Eh? 200, yeah, it's about 155 grams. About 150 grams. 155, typically. Now, how do I know this? Well, every time I get into a store, you know, one of the uh, veg sections, I take an apple and just place it on the scale just to get a feel for it. Or I just say an average apple. So it's nice to know these numbers. But how big is the mole? So just to give an idea, 6,02 times 10 to the power 23, just to give an idea, to get a visual for it. If you took Coke cans, the Coke cans will cover the surface of the entire 
earth to a depth of 200 miles. Okay, now we don't speak miles here. How big or long is a mile? 0.6 kilometers, sir. 0.6, or is it 1.2 kilometers? Which is bigger, a mile or a kilometer? A mile. Right, so that should be about 1.2 kilometers. Okay, so think about that. Uh, if you have that number of cans, uh, Avogadro's number, you could cover the entire earth to a depth of 200 miles, and you can work that out in kilometers, just to get a visual. If you're playing around with Avogadro's number and popcorn seeds, then it says here, if you had Avogadro's number of popcorn seeds and spread them across the US, <coughs> excuse me, I don't understand why we keep referring to the US, the country would be covered in popcorn to a depth of nine miles. Okay, that's mm. quite a number. 14 kilometers. Correct, yes. That's the depth, okay? So that means if you had to tunnel your way through, you let to tunnel your way through 14 kilometers of popcorn seeds before you hit the Earth's surface. And if you look at Avogadro's number, this is very interesting. If you're able to count the atoms at a rate of 10 billion per second, It'll take 2 billion years to get it, to count one mole. So these are big numbers. I mean, they're throwing numbers at you. And also you want to ask yourself right now as a student of chemistry, but how many atoms are there in the universe? You know, is there a finite number of atoms in the universe? And these are interesting questions. Are all atoms identical? We know all atoms are not identical, but if they are the same element, they are. So let's come back to the mole. So we now know that, uh, so here's the thing, you know, I'm going to come back to the point when I said one mole is 6,02 times 10 to the power 23 things. I changed the word things to particles and watch what I do now. I change the word particles to atoms. And I keep emphasizing this because this is one of the biggest setbacks in chemistry when students don't understand the difference between ions, atoms, and molecules and then the calculations go wrong. So firstly, AU is the formula for what? Which element? Gold. Gold, yes. I was worried that someone's gonna say Australia. Um, I, had that, I actually had that in a chemistry first year exam at university. One mole of Australia. Sheesh, okay. So Australia is made of gold. So one mole of gold consists of 6,02 times 10 to the power 23 atoms. Focus on the word atoms. Next, watch this. One mole of water, H2O. Now look at the word atoms have now changed to molecules. All right? So one mole of water consists of 6,02 times 10 to the power 23, identical number, but of molecules. So what's the difference between gold and water? Anyone? Sir, so gold so is an water element is a and water is a compound. Perfect. Gold is an element. So it's made of identical atoms. And then we've got water is a compound made of two hydrogen and one oxygen. And hence we speak of molecules. So to give you an idea, I love these animations. I just love, love these animations. And so thankful for the creators of these. I started chemistry when I was your age, what, almost 40 years ago. We didn't even have computers. So the teacher would draw on the board and uh, yeah, we'd pretend to see these things flying around. But uh, this is a picture of an atom. So you have a central nucleus. You're familiar with that. And those yellow spheres that are traveling around, um, what, are, what is the name of those particles traveling around those little orbits? Electrons. Okay, I'm just checking to see whether you're awake and you're with me there. That's an atom. So if you think of that, we're referring to the atoms from an element. Now, what are molecules? So if you look at molecules, this is an animation of a network of water molecules. So water molecule, if you look there, the red portion over there is the oxygen. And then you got attached to the oxygen molecule are two hydrogen atoms. And then there's a whole network. And when you get to grade 10, you will be studying the forces between water molecules. Those are called hydrogen bonds. Those are the little dots that you see between the molecules. So if you have a glass of water, for instance, that's basically what you're drinking, a whole network of stuff. And for most of the time, if you look at, say, a glass of water, 
in between the molecules is actually empty space. All right. Um, so now you know the difference between the atoms, molecules, and when I speak of the mole, why I refer to atoms, molecules, and I can also refer to ions, I-O-N-S. So for instance, one mole of sodium chloride, which is table salt, consists of 6,02 times 10 to the power 23 ions, I-O-N-S. Have you come across the word ion? The end of my slide. Have you come across this word here? Isn't an ion a charged atom? That's it. That's all I needed to know. Yes, the ion is a charged atom. Thank you. That's spot on. Perfect. All right. So we spoke about the periodic table. Your homework for this weekend is to learn the first 20 elements, uh, learn their names, um, the position, the number of electrons, the number of protons, the number of neutrons. And you think it might go to waste. Trust me, guys, it doesn't go to waste. You know, we spend so much of time, uh, you know, watching YouTube videos and being on Instagram and taking tons of information. But here's a really good, uh, useful set of information that you, you'd want to know. Uh, even if you don't take up chemistry in the future, post metric, but at least learn this. I mean, this is really, really important. Uh, try not to learn the, any, the entire periodic table. Um, I've never done that. Um, just learn the first 20 learn the halogens, no, uh, noble gases, and then obviously some of the radioactive substances. And that, that was really good. Okay, so let's come back to the concept now. So just to recall very quickly today, uh, you know how to write formulae, right? Uh, you know how to name compounds, but we'll need a lot more practice. I've introduced you to the concept of the mole. I've, I've already told you that the mole is a quantity of substance, right? which contains exactly 6,02 times 10 to the power 23 particles. Now I'll introduce you to the concept of molar mass. But before I do that, you know, I spoke about gold and I don't know why I put the slide at the end, but I'm just gonna quickly run to that slide and tell you why I find all of this so fascinating. Uh, it's a very long lecture, but here. So try to imagine, we have a gold inclined plane. When I say inclined plane, I just mean a slope. So, I mean, we refer to this in physics as an inclined plane. So there's a slope, you can see there's a slope over here. And then I have a sphere, a ball, made of pure gold atoms. So the slope is made of pure gold atoms. I've got slope here, it's slope. And I've got a ball that's made of pure gold atoms. Now, what I wanna do is take this ball and place it on that surface. Let me just save all of this as well while I'm here. Right. My question is, what will happen to that ball? The tiny gold ball bearing or sphere, what's gonna to happen to it? It's gonna roll. Right, so yes, the common sense answer to that would be yes, it will roll down the plane because gravity will pull it down the plane. That's exactly the answer I gave almost 35, 40 years ago, I can't even remember. And strangely enough, if the ball is made of pure gold atoms and the slope is made of pure gold atoms, and the ball is really tiny and you placed it there, the ball will not roll. It'll just stay there. Now this is, Okay, so I thought, okay, that's cool. Now what happens if you increased the angle of the slope and made it steeper and steeper and steeper? And the reasoning is the ball still would not roll. And even if the slope was vertical, I keep hitting the end of it. If the slope was vertical, the ball will not fall to the ground. And even if you turn the slope or table upside down, the ball will not fall. Do you believe that? It seems, it seems crazy, right? To think that gravity will not pull the ball away from this table. So this experiment is called a thought experiment and it's due to a guy called Richard Feynman. Learn this name, Google this name. And so Feynman concluded the following, if the ball is made of pure gold and if the slope was made of pure gold atoms, the moment the ball makes contact with the slope, the atoms in the ball don't know whether they belong to the slope or the ball. And similarly, 
the atoms in the slope, because they're all the same, they don't know whether they belong to the slope or the ball, and there's an immediate welding or bonding, and hence the ball will not roll. How cool is that? The problem is, we can't do this experiment because we don't have pure gold. A lot of people say your jewelry is pure gold, but it's not. It's filled with all sorts of contaminants, all right? So if someone could produce pure gold atoms in a ball and a slope, we could try this experiment. It'll be pretty awesome to see that it doesn't roll down that slope. And that's what brings joy to chemistry. These sort of experiments, these sort of thought experiments, and also observations. All right, so let's quickly run through this uh, and get here. There we go. The molar mass, very, very important concept. I spoke to Sir, your chemistry uh, uh, master, and he says he introduced you guys to balancing of equations. Do you guys know how to balance equations? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. So I'm going to quickly put up a, uh, an equation. This is not a test, um, so don't take it as a test. But let's do something very simple. Let's take hydrogen. H2. We're going to combine that with oxygen and obviously we're going to produce which compound? When you combine hydrogen with oxygen, yeah. what do you, you produce water. Right, excellent. Complete that. Thank you. Uh, is it H2O2 or just H2O? H2O. H2O. Okay, H2O. now what is H2O2? Thank you for actually putting Peroxide. That's hydrogen peroxide, yes. So can we remove that from that screen so I can put down the correct formula or you want to remove that second two? Anyone? Remove the second two. Okay, let's get that out of the way. So here we go. So this is H2O. Now I keep getting to the end of that slide because the slide itself is quite narrow. Up to the edge of it. Here we go. H two O. Okay, that's perfect. Now, can anyone balance this for me? Oh, yeah, I just want to remove my stuff from there, and just want to go back. I just want to save these things because when we get the video, then right, it's H two plus O two to give me H two O. Perfect. Can anyone balance this reaction for me? Sir, would yes? it be on the reaction side, you put the two before the H? Uh, on the left hand side, is that right? Or on the right hand side? Yes. On the left. Okay, you say put a two here. Yes. Okay, okay, that's it. Good, good. Excellent. Perfect. So that's right. So you got two H2O, so you got four on this side, correct? You got two oxygens there. You got four hydrogens there and two oxygen, so it's balanced. Thank you, that's brilliant. Excellent. So let me give you another one. Uh, something that comes to mind would be something like calcium carbonate, which is nothing more than the formula for lime, slate lime, plus HCl. And I'm gonna give this as CaCl2 plus H2. So I keep reaching the end of the screen, H2O. Plus, what do you think? What's the third component here? Let's just see. Let's just test you. What else will form in this reaction? Carbon. Okay, thank you. Carbon and something. Carbon just doesn't think about this very much. Oxygen. Quickly. Yes. Carbon monoxide. Carbon, it could be carbon, thank you. So this is actually carbon dioxide. Excellent, guys. That's brilliant. Cheers. Cheers. So you're happy with the CO2? Can you see the CO2 at the end there? Yes, sir. Right, now, quickly, check, check for me. Is this reaction balanced? We have one calcium left, one calcium right. We have how many carbons? One carbon on the left, one carbon on the right. Three so it's not sure, balanced. The calciums are, the calcium, I mean the chlorines are No, the chlorine. Sir. Chlorine's unbalanced, sir. Right, the chlorine. So how do I balance the chlorine? Someone? Perfect, excellent. Thank you, so that's, that's it. Is it now balanced? Yes, it was simple as that, right? 
So everything is balanced and the reaction's there. So, okay, so you're happy with balancing of reactions and equations. So now I just want to, to talk about the molar mass, a very, very important concept in chemistry, and that is the mass of one mole of a substance. We already know one mole consists of 6.02 times 10 to the power 23 particles. That's Avogadro's constant, all right? But what we need to do is basically look at something called the atomic mass. So it says use the average, yes, question? No, okay. Use the average atomic mass rounded to the nearest whole number. Now, I wanna take you back to the periodic table because this is very important. If you look at this periodic table, okay, this is not a really good one. Does anyone remember, let's try and get something like, let's look at lithium. I'm not sure whether you have a periodic table in front of you. Lithium on the top, the smaller number, what does that refer to in the periodic table? You always have two numbers to an element, one smaller than the other. So for instance, let's look at lithium. Lithium normally would have three at the top and seven at the bottom. So for instance, you add lithium, the periodic table would be three and the bottom would be seven. What does the three tell you? What does it tell you? It represents the atomic number, which is the number of protons. And for a neutral element, that's also equal to the number of electrons. What is the bigger number seven represent? The mass. That's it, perfect. It's called the atomic mass. So when we speak of molar mass, we can average the molar mass and take that for an element, the molar mass would basically be its atomic mass. So for instance, when you look at one mole of carbon atoms, one mole of carbon atom is really nothing more than 12 grams. Because if I go to the periodic table, sorry, it's too much of animation there. If you look at carbon, it's got six protons, but it has an atomic mass of 12, six protons, six neutrons. So I just wanna go quickly here. And if you go to magnesium, it's 24 grams, and then one mole of copper. If you go to the periodic table, if you have one in front of you, it says its atomic mass is 63.5. So one mole of copper atoms is 63.5 grams. So you can read that off the periodic table. We refer to that as the molar mass. Right, the molar mass of molecules. Now this is absolutely important. And this is where the chemistry really plays a role in, kind of, in terms of calculation and conservation of mass, all right? It's called a molecular mass. Molecular mass because we're looking at compounds. So for example, one mole of calcium carbonate, I need to know what its molecular mass. And this is obviously the crux of my lesson today. How do we calculate this? Watch this. The molecular mass, we use a symbol capital M. And because we're looking at calcium carbonate, CaCO3, this is the way I do it and it's never failed me. You don't have to follow this method. You always do what you're comfortable with. Calcium carbonate consists of one ca calcium atom, one calcium atom. So one calcium atom, one carbon atom, and how many oxygen atoms? Three. Three, so watch this. So plus three oxygens. And I always underline the oxygen because if you don't underline the oxygen, then you mistake that for a zero and becomes 30. Now, if I go to the periodic table, calcium has a mass of 20, carbon has a mass of 12. You can read this off your periodic table. And oxygen is 16, so three times 16, that's 48 plus 12 plus 20. That will give me a mass of 100 <laughs> grams per mole. This is very, very important. So the unit per molecular mass is grams per mole. So it tells me that calcium carbonate has, is 100 grams per mole. So one mole of calcium carbonate will have a mass of 100 grams. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. so that's the reason why I say master the periodic table elements one to 20, you see? I didn't look at the periodic table. I basically said, okay, I know calcium is 20, carbon is 12, oxygen, very popular one, 16, 16 times three, 48. I just want to go back here, just to take you back to the periodic table. That's why it's so important. If you look at oxygen, the smaller number is eight, but generally at the bottom, it'll be 16. 
So the atomic mass is what counts, not the um, the proton number. Sorry, so is it Stefan? Matteo had your hand up. Question? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Let me go back there. So the it number is 20, 12, and 48 doesn't add up to 100. Oh, yes, because I was just checking whether you're awake. This is 40, by the way. Sorry. Thank you. Does that make 100 now? Yes. So 40 plus 12 plus 48 is 100. So the mass of calcium is actually 48, not 20. All right. Um, that was a deliberate mistake. Thank you for picking that up. That's the reason why I say it's important to actually learn these things up, but not the whole periodic table. We don't have time for the whole periodic table. There's a lot more happening in life, like Netflix and all that stuff. So the first 20 elements would be useful for everybody. Thank you for picking that up. Right, so now we're looking at the molar mass of potassium oxide, K2O. So now we've got to go to potassium and you ask ourselves, well, potassium, what is the molecular mass or the atomic uh, mass, sorry, of potassium? Potassium is 39, all right? So we go like this, MK2O, two potassiums plus one oxygen, I underline would be two from the periodic table would be 39 and then plus one times 16. Add that up and that'll give you grams per mole. Don't forget the units, the units are grams per mole. The same thing would happen here, but I want you to talk me through this one. If I want the molar mass of aluminum oxide, watch this, this is very important. ALOH3. How many aluminiums in that molecule? How many aluminium one. One, so I'll put one AL. What do I do next? Three oxygen atoms. Sorry, that three should be on the outside here, there. So you're right, it's gonna be three, but it's better to write it like this. If you're starting off, it will be three OH. You agree with me? There's a three is in the outside, so the three must multiply the whole bracket. And as someone yes, was saying, this is one aluminium, plus how many oxygens? Three oxygens. Three oxygens plus? Three hydrogens. Perfect. And so you basically go and work out the, from your periodic table, you read down the mass for aluminium, oxygen, hydrogen, sum them up, and there you have it. You have the molar mass of aluminium uh, hydroxide. This is aluminium hydroxide. Okay. It's not difficult. Is it 78? Sorry? Is it 78? 78? Grams per mole. Is that the total? Uh, I think so. Okay. I'll put it down at 78 grams per mole, but when you get the video, you can actually confirm that. 78 grams per mole, that's how you read that. Okay, uh, converting moles and grams. Now, this is absolutely important. We have some time. Any questions, guys? Anything that you want to ask me? Anything? Can we remove this? Is, how do we get rid of that writing on the screen there? Is anyone can remove that? Oh. So the person who wrote it has to remove it, I think. Okay, whoever's written that, can they remove that so that we can just have a nice, clear, beautiful screen? Oh, thank you so much. Brilliant. Okay, excellent. That was a beautiful color, by the way. Um, so converting moles to n grams. So this is some really cool chemistry, right? Aluminium. Does anyone know what aluminium is used for? Or aluminum? Why is aluminum so expensive? And where do you find it in the kitchen? So I know why it's expensive, but I don't know where it's used in the kitchen. Okay, aluminum, aluminum foil? You have foil in the kitchen? Foil? Oh. Right. Oh. oh. Yes, yes. There's a lot of kitchen physics and chemistry taking place. It's amazing. You can do a whole, your, your, your kitchen is your laboratory, by the way. Where can you find iron filings in your kitchen? Let's ask some questions here. Iron filings. You have a metal of... scrubber where you do the dishes. Uh, uh, it's like oh, a right. an iron thing where you scrub the... The scourer, pots. yes. Yes, the scourer. Excellent. Uh, you'll also find iron in your breakfast cereal, right? Your Kellogg's, for instance. 
So I want you to do this experiment. This is a really cool experiment, right? You take some Kellogg's cereal, put it in a Ziploc bag, fill some water. But before you do that, crush up the cereal into very fine powder into a Ziploc bag and basically fill that bag up with water. So you have a mush or mush or mixture of cereal with water in a Ziploc bag. And if you take a very powerful magnet and you hold it towards that bag, you'll find a black spot appearing inside the bag. And that black spot consists of fine iron particles. So your food obviously contains iron. So if you read the back of your cereal box, it says iron and you're able to separate the iron from the cereal by diluting it in water and then using a magnet. That is so cool, all right? You can try that as well. So you have an aluminum foil in your kitchen. Aluminum is used widely in the aerospace industry, for instance. It's now being used, obviously it's being replaced by Kevlar and all sorts of other materials. But aluminum is lightweight, so very useful. Spacecraft, for instance, also use a lot of aluminum or aluminum. Uh, you may have heard of area 50 what? One. Right, area 51, there's a whole lot of hoo-ha around that. And way back somewhere, I think in the 1940s or 1950s, Roswell, apparently they found a piece of aluminum and reportedly from a, it belonged uh, to an alien spacecraft. So I've been following this for the last 40 years. I'm still confused. And I, every time I meet uh, youngsters like yourselves, I, I mention it. So hopefully that you would read up and research as well. Was it really uh, an alien spaceship? Was it an uh, Earth-made uh, satellite or balloon? And actually crashed there. Very interesting. But anyway, let's come back to this here. So now we know about moles. We know how to calculate molecular mass. And now let's come on to how do we go from moles to grams? So remember, when we sit at the dinner table or we talk to each other, we don't speak of moles. I mean, you would have never heard of the word mole in terms of chemistry until today, or maybe some of you would have read. But you don't want to tell me, pass me one mole of aluminum or oh, I need one mole of copper to do this experiment. No, you, you'd speak of grams, you'll speak of mass, all right? So you speak of a copper bracelet uh, saying what, 30 grams or 25 grams or whatever. So how do we convert? How do we go from the chemist to being a normal human being? I'm not saying the chemists are not normal human beings. So how do we convert from moles to grams? So here is aluminum widely used in the manufacture of soft drink cans. Yes, how could I forget? Your Coke cans made of aluminum, all right? How many grams of aluminum are in five moles of aluminum? Okay, that's poorly worded. Now, can someone give me the atomic mass for aluminum? From your periodic table? What's the, so we'll call that the, the weight of aluminium. What's if you go to the periodic table? This periodic table is really bad because I only have the atomic number. I don't have the mass here. You see, there's aluminium here. So isn't it twenty six? Is it twenty six or twenty seven? It's twenty six point something something. Yeah. I think so it I was. think when we do that, we can actually round it off. Remember, we're taking the average. Uh, oh, we'll speak about average. Point nine, so. Yeah. So it's twenty seven. Twenty seven. Correct. So the mass there is 27 grams per mole, per mole, like that. So now the question says, how many grams is that, all right, if you have five moles of aluminum? So there's a formula, and this formula lives with you. This is something you have to remember. And the formula is this. the number of moles of a substance is equals to mass in grams, mass, over its molar mass. It's as simple as that. The number of moles is equal to mass in grams all over the molar mass. So the question says, how many grams? So we need to calculate grams. So normally I write it like this. Number of moles is little m over capital M. So now they want us to find little m. This is the mass in grams. How do I change the subject of the formula? How do I solve for m? from this formula.
you multiply by capital M. Okay, because this is N over one, is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. So when we cross multiply, watch this, N times one is M, and N times capital M would give me the mass in grams. So if you look at this problem, I got five moles, so that's gonna be five times 27. What is five times 27 without a calculator? 135. And what will be the units for my answer? Grams. Thank you very much. So now we know what to do, and this is it, guys. This is where now chemistry starts to take off, because now we know how to convert from moles, which is the language of chemists, to grams, which is our language. So if someone spoke about five grams of aluminium, I know five grams of aluminium is 135. Uh, five moles of aluminium is 135 grams. So while we're there, I just wanna ask you very quickly. Oh, here's a beautiful question here for the morning, right? If you have 30 grams, watch this. If you have 30 grams of CO2, how many moles do you have? Now we're going the other way. We got the mass. I want to go to moles. Remember the formula. Number of moles is mass in grams over, now because CO2 is a compound, we speak of molecular mass. Very quickly, can someone work out the molecular mass of CO2? Let's do that first. In your periodic table, we know CO2 consists of how many carbon atoms? One. How many oxygen atoms? Two. 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 Carbon on the periodic table is 12. Oxygen is 16. 32, and that becomes 44. What's the units for molecular mass? Grams per mole. Grams per mole. Thank you very much. So now they want to know how many grams. So we need, so we, now we've got the mass. We want to work out how many moles. Moles. So we just go, number of moles is 30 grams. There's the 30 over here. Over 44 is the number of moles. And that's your answer. That's it. Problem solved. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Are there any questions up to this point, guys? Are you happy with this? Yes, sir. All right. So we have last few minutes. Are there any comments, any questions? Uh, I generally never take the full lesson when I lecture at university. I always leave time for questions, comments, anything that's not clear to you. And hopefully that we will meet again next week uh, to go through some stuff. But before you go, you know, it's always, for me, here's a really nice slide. I really like this slide. Uh, and it tells you what really happens in uh, chemical reactions. We, we don't think about it, you know. We just do things. So if you look at this slide here, it says, what, what silver, AG, right? That's the uh, formula. So now look, it's a summary of everything that we did so far today. It's beautiful, okay? We're saying that two moles of silver which we can actually work out now, two moles of silver, we know it's mass. And S, what is the, what does S stand for? It's the- Sulfur. Sulfur. Yes. Sulfur is this beautiful uh, yellow powder. So if you combine two moles of silver with one mole of sulfur, you produce one mole of silver sulfide. Now look at the, look at the, look at the nature of this. Thing. Silver is a bright, beautiful silver element, combines with sulfur, and watch what it produces. But there's something very, very important that's taking place over here. You start off with silver and sulfur. If you add the masses, you get 247,9 grams. When the reaction completes, when it takes place and reaches completion, notice the mass of the product. Mass of the product equals the mass of the reactant. So that's called conservation of mass. You have come across conservation of mass in grade eights. Mass cannot be created or destroyed. 
but converted one from one form into another. So this is a really beautiful illustration of the conservation of mass. And that's the reason why we balance these equations, chemical reactions, because mass is conserved, all right? So my parting shot now, just the last point. Uh, you know, I spoke about the inclined plane. I'm just gonna go back there today with something and maybe next week you can also uh, watch this. So there's an inclined plane, right? It's just a slope. Think of your table, and if you lift the table up at one end, it becomes a slope. If you place a cool ring can on the slope, what's going to happen to that cool ring can? Anyone? It'll roll down. It'll roll down the plane. Yeah, some of you are thinking, oh, okay, maybe it'll get stuck to the plane. No, it will roll down the plane. Now, I'm going to ask the question very quickly, and you may want to think about this because I'm also setting up an experiment. Hopefully, I'll record this. The can will start to roll down the plane. It'll get to the plane. Is it possible for that can to roll back up the plane all by itself? No, sir. All right, Not so sure. you say no, that's good. Okay, there are three possibilities, right? Can rolling down, the answer will be no, it can't. Yes, maybe, or I'm not sure. Well, I'm gonna say the following. You can create an experiment by placing a can on a slope. The can will roll down the plane. When it gets to the bottom of the plane right there, it will now roll back up the plane by itself. You don't have to push it up. So I want you to think about it. That's your homework. That's your homework. Your homework is not about calculations. Your homework is not about doing mathematical formulae and stuff. Yes, think about the mole and look at the periodic table. But your homework is to think very deeply and share this with your friends and family. How is it possible to set up an experiment for a can to roll down an inclined plane, get to the bottom, and then roll all the way up by itself? And if you're able to set up an experiment like that, that'll be pretty awesome. Try not to use Google. Google just cre kills creativity. It, cre it kills the imagination. So guys, I hope you enjoyed that lesson. I like to call it a lecture, not a lesson. And hopefully we'll meet again pretty soon. Are you guys happy with that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you, you so much. We will send you the recording so you can go through this very slowly. So thank you so much for your time. Stay safe and enjoy thank the weekend. Much, thank you, sir. You too. Thank you, sir. Thanks, guys.